discuss the future of the class on Monday. So we'll talk about projects, kind of the remaining rest of the class. Today we're going to talk about web security and we're going to introduce everyone to the web. Any questions from uh, homework twos? Been graded? You will get your grades. We'll say tomorrow is the latest. To not, to not commit to anything, I don't know. But we'll, we'll email you directly with your grades, so it'll be very clear. So we'll get an email with your grades. You individually, not everyone. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Did you know one or one? No, I haven't. So it'll be your cumulative up to this point. In the midterms being graded, it'll probably be sometime next week. We actually calculated out what is it? There's uh, eight problems for 142 students. It's like 1,100. What was it? 143 100, students. Oh, 43 students, sorry. 143. Oh, yeah. That's like 1,000 questions to grade of all of your amazing handwriting, too, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Any other questions? Let's get examining. OK. So the web. Anybody use the web today? Yeah. Anybody not use the web today? No. <laughs> I'm actually curious. I actually don't think it's possible. Right. First question, what's the difference between the web and the internet? First first question, are they interchangeable? Are they the same thing? No, especially not for you because you're computer scientists. You're not a journalist or a, a media person writing an article about it. So what's the difference? Let's start with the easy one. What's the internet? Somebody wanted to find the internet? Yeah, in the back. It's the uh, network of networks. Network of networks, right? Runs what? What protocols? The internet? TCP? UDP? IP? Right, IPv6, yeah, that's about there. The internet is kind of all of those interconnections, right? But HTTP lives at the top layer, right? So HTTP actually, the internet doesn't care about HTTP, right? All it cares about is TCP, UDP, and IP. Yeah. So then what's the web? <laughs> it is a higher level layer. What level? It's Application level? Okay. So what makes up the web? How do you know if something is the web or not? Set of protocols. What is that? Set of protocols. Ooh, what set of protocols? HTTP. HTTP? SMTP. SMTP is SMTP. It has nothing to do with the web. FTP. FTP is its own protocol. It has nothing to do with the web. These actually both predated the web. So, REST, SOAP, ah, those are HTTP higher level kind of protocols. HTTPS. HTTPS, ah, okay, I'll take it. It's basically <laughs> HTTP over TLS, so it's, you know. What do you get back when you make an HTTP request? HTML. HTML, that's the third one, or the second one. Let's get rid of HTTPS. HTTP, HTML, the other one is URLs. These are the three core technologies of the web, and this is what we're going to talk about. Um, so the web, when it was initially created, was created by Sir Tim Berners-Lee in 19, come on, guys, in, I think it was 92. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee, he actually has a great story. There's a fantastic book called Weaving the Web, which is him recounting his tale of how he created the web. So Tim Berners-Lee was a research scientist at CERN. Has anybody heard of CERN? What do they do? Science. They do science. <laughs> Correct answer. That was their big thing. The LHC, right? The Large Hydrogen Collider, right? They're probably trying to end Earth as we know it by creating a black hole. That's probably their end game. But what they say they're doing, they're studying science, and they're 
you're studying particles and trying to smash particles together, right? So, CERN is in a huge organization even back in the 90s, right? And you think about ASU being a huge organization, we're not trying to collide the atoms into each other, right? That requires a lot of different scientists with a lot of different specialties. And so, well, I think I should call him Sir Tim, I guess, because he's a knight now. Uh, but back in the day, he was just regular Tim. <laughs> and I don't consider watching this, that would be fun. Uh, so he realized, wow, it's really difficult for, to even know who's working on what thing in the organization, right? There was no like really centralized phone book. And here you have this basically academics who are there and gone and visiting for short periods of time, right? This constant churn. He was like, man, it would be great to have a way, like a centralized, lo some kind of location so that we can know where everybody is, where their office is, what their phone number is. And he was also really interested in this hypermedia idea, which was the idea that you could just view a document and there would be essentially a way to access further information from that document. And in our case, it's in the form of links. So he submitted this proposal to CERN to build basically this hypermedia system to find people, right? And to see what everyone was working on. So this is the first basically graphical version of the World Wide Web. So super interesting things are that he developed this on a next step computer. Anybody know what next was? Steve Jobs project. Yeah, this is Steve Jobs company after he got booted out of Apple. So they developed these devices uh, these whole operating system and computers. And this is where he developed the first hypermedia browser. And a super interesting thing here is that slash editor at the end there. So in his view, he actually started the web with more of a wiki style view. Uh, you could not only browse HTML content, but you could also edit it right in your browser. So that's why you had this idea of a browser slash editor. Um, and actually, I will tell you this, I'm still trying to get this to work. Uh, I've actually got the next operating system to run in, what is it? I can't remember which hypervisor I was using, uh, probably VMware. It actually does work, and you can browse the web using this old browser because the basic protocols still work. Um, this is widely recognized as the very first web page. And it's actually insane to think about how close this is with a modern web page today, right? You go to a web page, it can look exactly like this. Um, so information about the web, this is Sir Tim, you, uh, you create something as important as the internet, you, I guess if you're a British citizen, you may be knighted too, so <laughs> maybe Brits in the audience can look forward to that. So he first created this proposal in 89, he then finished the first website at the end of 1990, so when you think about that, that's how many years? 27 years, right? And you think about how popular the web is now, if you even think about how popular the web was in 98, right? By 98, 99, we already had the first dot-com bubble, right? That's literally nine years after he first created the internet. Oh, sorry, not, see, look at me, I did. Uh, he first created the web, his very first version in 1990. Like, that's insane kind of adoption metrics. Uh, this is the book, highly recommended. So really, he combined all these technologies. He combined hypertext, <laughs> the internet, so TCP IP, so he built this on top of TCP. And the idea really grew into universal access to a large universe of documents. So he kind of envisioned the web as all these documents out there. And you want to be able to access one, which should give you links to other documents. Right? And so you can browse around information in this way. Three central things if you're trying to design and imagine a universe of documents. How do you name things? How do I know what document to get? That's a central question, right? How do I request a document? And then how does that person, let's call it a server or whatever, respond to my request for a document? And the third one is how do we actually create hypertext? So how do you create a document that actually links to other documents? And so this gives rise to the three central technologies that we talked about. URIs and URLs define how do I identify a specific resource on the web. 
HTTP defines how do I, once I know about a resource, how do I make a request? And finally, HTML defines, hey, when you've got a document, this is what a hypertext, hypermedia document is. Any questions on this? The super key three technologies. Without these, you don't really understand how the web works. There's a lot more, but these are the first three. And they operate in this beautiful loop. This is why I really like that. So you have the URI, and we'll find out that URI tells your browser or other user agent how to fetch content. So the URI defines how to make an HTTP content, sorry, how to make an HTTP request. Then when you make a request, you get a response. That response will be in HTML. That HTML has links on that page, which tells, which are URIs, which show you other documents. So you have this beautiful circle of the web life. So why is it called the web? Yeah. So if you're trying to visualize it, right? In one document, it has links to other things. Each of those document has links to other things, right? Why is it not a tree? Because the links can so go back. Like yeah, no the links, links can go back, right? You can have bi-directional links, right? Links pointing all over the places, right? Yeah. So I cannot have graph. Can you not what? A graph. We have links as a. Well. Yeah, but a web sounds cooler. <laughs> 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 then you can't have a crawler. <laughs> I, I think that may be the answer because there is no good answer. So it may be like Tim was like, hmm, web sounds so much cooler than a graph. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever meet him, I'll ask him why web and why not uh, graph. Okay. So starting with the first technology, URIs are the center for everything, right? If you don't know how to name something, how can you ever ask for a document? Right? So you've seen URIs before. They are essentially metadata of how to reach or find a specific resource. So it answers the which server has this document? How do I ask that server for the document? How can the server locate that resource? So the server, I know, now that I know which server to talk to, of the thousands of documents that this server has, how does that server know to give me this specific document? There is, as I'm sure aware, RFCs, right? I'm harping on RFCs and the pages, documentation, right? There's an RFC that describes exactly what a URI is. Yes? Can you class arguments in like the URI too? We'll talk about that, but that's more related to the third question. How does the server locate the resource? So, syntax. It's pretty easy. This actually will map in with, so, the U from URI stands for universal. So, actually, this scheme is for more than just HTTP requests. That's probably why some of you are thinking about FTP, right? You can give somebody a link or a URI with FTP described in it. So, that's this first part of a URI. The scheme describes one of the standard of schemes. So, that would be HTTP, HTTPS. FTP, whatever. Authority defines who is the server, who should I talk to for this information. And in between those two is a semicolon. Then there's a slash. And then there's some path part of a URI. And then we can have a question mark and with some query part. And then after that, there could be a hash with a fragment part. So breaking all these down. So the scheme is the protocol, like we said. The authority is the entity. So an interesting thing about that is the authority is the one that controls how to interpret everything else. So this actually goes back to your question. Everything else is essentially meaningless, right? The path, the query, the fragment is kind of important because it depends on your user agent. We'll talk about that in a second. But that path, those query parameters, as an agent, as somebody trying to request a resource, they're just blobs to you. You don't care. Oftentimes, they are in human-readable text so that developers can understand it, you can understand it, right? But there's nothing that implicitly says it has to be that way. Uh, the authority is usually a server name. It's usually in this form. 
um, username at host. So you can actually specify what username at what host. This is why if you ever got a link with an FTP credentials already in it, this is how it's passed. Um, and then a colon and then a port. So this is actually how you specify uh, if you've ever gone to a non-standard port, like google.com colon, I don't know, random port name. That's how you specify the port name there. And this is TCP port we're talking about here, right? Okay, the path is usually exactly what we think of when we think of a path, but it does not have to be, right? That's the important thing. It is usually a hierarchical path with slashes, just like a file system path. The query is used to pass on what we call non-hierarchical data. So for something that doesn't fit the folder kind of paradigm of the path, and again, these are all conventions. This is usually. And the fragment is actually super interesting. So the fragment is used to identify a subsection or sub-resource of the resource. So we'll talk about exactly where that comes in in a bit. But any questions on URIs? Yes? Why are there two columns after each? There's not. There's two slashes. HTTP colon slash slash authority google.com. I can't remember. That's a good question. All right, we'll look at that in a second. I think that's part of the authority. I can't remember if it's required. Maybe I need to change the syntax there. Or maybe there's additional sub syntax from the RFC that I'm not putting in there. But I definitely took all that from the RFC, so I'll have to relook at that. Let's keep going. So we can then parse these URIs. We can say that, OK, this URI is for scheme foo. The authority is example. Well, in this case, the authority would be slash slash example.com colon 8042. The path would be over slash there. And the query would be test equals bar. And the fragment would be nose. You can have FTP, so the link to an RFC on the FTP server. Same thing, FTP colon slash slash, the authority, and then the path. So this one has no query and no fragment. You could also have things for email. So this is how you have defined an email in a URI. So here the scheme is mailed to. And here the authority is dupay at asu.edu. So here the scheme is actually the one defining what the authority means. Yeah, so for here you don't have the slash slash on the authority. That's a good question. Other cool things with HTTPS. So why does this look weird? Is it valid? What is the what's the scheme? What's the authority? Example.com or slash slash example.com. The path? How come this isn't the scheme? Or how come this of the authority? How come this isn't the Host name. How come the host name is an example.com slash test slash example and then the port is colon one dot html question mark and then the path is slash Adam. Does it? I mean we know that, but we have to parse it first before we can know what what port number is valid. RFC, what about the RFC? Tells you what characters can be where. Yeah, so that's part of the problem, right? And so we can already see that there are special characters in a URI, right? Colon, slash, uh, question mark, and hash are all characters that will affect the parsing of this URI. So just like in Bash, when you want to, or even in your favorite programming language, right? 
When you're at a string in double quotes and you want to include a literal double quote character, what do you have to do? Escape it. There has to be some kind of escaping scheme. So the same thing with URI. So there are a set of reserved characters that are supposed to always be encoded. And the way this is, is done with what they call percent encoding. So I will definitely agree with anyone who says the fact that we have like 10 different encoding systems on the web is insane. And you are absolutely correct, it is 100% insane. Uh, but we're kind of stuck with all these protocols, so you need to learn them and say, wow, what can we learn in the future when we design these new things? So the idea behind percent encoding, we need to encode anything. So it's stated in the RFC that we need to use this percent encoding for anything that's not alphabetic, a digit, that's a dash, a dot, an underscore, or a tilde. These are the things that we can use freely. Everything else should be percent encoded. So what is percent encoding? You use the percent sign. Boom. <laughs> then you use the hexadecimal representation of the digit. So if you wanted to URL, enclo URL encode lowercase a, what would you be? What would that be? Percent six one. We looked at those things so long I like memorized it. The six five four three two. Right. So it's the hexadecimal representation. So it's a percent followed by two digits, each hexadecimal. So this means ampersand will get turned into percent twenty six. The percent sign. Can you use the percent sign? Why not? If you wanted to send your name as a percent sign, or if you wanted to access a resource that was named percent. Yeah, so the percent character is a special character now because we're using it to define this encoding. So just like with double quotes, we have to escape double quotes. And when you escape double quotes, what then do you have to escape? The backslash, right? So if you escape double quotes with backslashes, you then need to escape backslashes with an extra backslash. And then if you're passing that all to bash, you have this insane, horrible, like quadruple backslashes. Gets me a nightmare. But this means that you have to URL encode percents as percent 25 anytime you want to use them, not as a percent encoding. Space will get encoded as percent 20, and so on and so forth. So in our previous example, right, so if we want to fix this to be what we think it should parse, which characters do we need to change? <coughs> this colon in here, what else? Yeah, it depends on what I want to do. Maybe the percent, uh, the slash, or maybe the percent, maybe the percent, the, sorry, the question mark is part of the path, right? So it depends on what we mean with this URI. So if we would fix it kind of normally, we URL uh, URI percent encode the colon, which is a percent three A, and the hexadecimal digits A through S can be either uppercase or lowercase. The case doesn't matter there. And then the slash we're going to code as percent two F. And we've looked at enough shell code and slash slash the NSH enough to know that it's definitely two F. Okay. URIs can either, so for you to make a request based on this URI, what do you need to know? We need to know the authority so we know which server to talk to. We need to know the scheme to be able to know who to talk to. And we need to know everything else, the path. We need to know what things to send, as we'll see. Right. So when we, and so if I gave you this URI, this uniquely identifies one resource, one document, right? It has a scheme, it's not ambiguous, it has an authority, there's a path, there's a query, everything you need is all there. And so if I give this to you, I give this to anybody, I know we're gonna go to the same place and try to ask for the same resource. Am I guaranteed we'll get the same response? No, definitely not, but we'll at least be able to talk to the same machine, the same authority here. So 
This is what we would think of as an absolute URI. This URI will take us both to the exact same location, but you've probably seen in the browser, when you hover over a link that you're gonna click, 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 click. It's not always in this form. What are some other forms? Just, just dot, dot, dot. Yeah, just dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, right? So URIs can either be absolute or it can specify a location relative to the current document. So if you think about just like when you're in, on a Linux machine, you're in a certain directory, if you did cd dot dot, where that takes you depends on where you are, right? It depends on your context. Same thing here. If you have it, if you see a URI for dot dot slash foo, that will take you to a different URI depending on where you see that link, what the context is. So by itself, a relative URI makes no sense. Right? It's only in the context of, an, of a, a document. And you can actually, the, uh, let's see, relative URIs are a syntax of their own. So here, this means use the same scheme that you are using to access this page, but act, use that scheme to access example.com slash example slash demo.html. So if you're running this on, from a page that you got from an HTTP response, this will make a different request than an HTTPS response, because it will use the scheme of the enclosing page. So slash test slash help .html will be relative to the current path. So the scheme and authority here remain the same. And this one that we've seen, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, are relative to the current scheme, authority, and path. In all of these cases, context is incredibly important. Depending on the context, so you should be able to take, if I said, hey, on this page, you saw a link to dot dot slash dot dot slash people.html, where is that going to take you? Or what HTML, what HTTP request is that going to generate? The same thing for these other links, right? Yeah? Uh, will it still work if you have a bunch of slashes, like in the Linux file system? I believe so. I think technically, by the standards, it would be web server dependent. So they could probably choose how they wanted to handle that, but I believe. Try it now. Go to like, can we go to google.com slash 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 index.html? See if it works. No, you're all paying attention. Nobody wants to go to the computer to figure out the password test. <laughs> okay, the second protocol, hypertext transport protocol. If you look at the name, it was clear that these were all developed in tandem, right? This literally contains the name of HTML, hypertext. So you have URIs which tell you how to make HTTP requests, and you get back HTML in the HTTP response. So, this should be very easy for you, why? You already implemented a web server, and you run through the whole RFC to do so, right? <laughs> Nervous laughter, okay. So, when you break down HTTP, essentially it's a protocol for how a web client can request a resource from a web server, and that's all it is. So what do we think of as web clients? Browsers. Browsers, what else? Netcrawlers. Web crawlers, what else? Netcat. Netcat, you could even use net, you have to do all the protocol yourself, but you can definitely use Netcat. Botnets. <laughs> well, let's think of programs. Right? Any program can make any HTTP request, right? It doesn't need to, we can, we can remove judgments and say whether it's uh, a botnet or not. We don't actually care, but automated scripts, right? So there's the whole requests library in Python that is freaking the best thing ever for making requests, and HTTP requests. So that's, in essence, a web client. You can also have, there are, uh, GUI list browsers, you can like links, L-Y-N-X, that you can use to browse the web. Um, I used to use Emacs, you can set up Emacs to use like W3M so you can get web browsing in Emacs, which actually is super useful for documentation because you can just keep the docs there 
in your Emacs session. You don't have to go anywhere else. It's super awesome. Okay, so HTTP is based on TCP. And it uses port 80 by default. So that's the other super important thing. So when you see a URI, if there's no port specified in that URI, what port do you assume? Depends on the scheme. If the scheme is HTTP, you assume 80. Trick question. So version 1.2. So you think about how early, right? First web page you had in 90. We had already standardized the first version of HTTP 1.0 in May 1996. Version 1.1 in 99, and version 2.0, actually you should look, it's based on a Google proposal called SPDY, which actually very much changes the paradigm of what we're gonna learn and takes everything to binary. So instead of ASCII text being transmitted back and forth, as we'll see, it's actually binary protocol, which makes it more efficient. There's all these other components, but since it's still not really used very widely, we're gonna leave it for now. But there's an RFC that you can read, or a proposed RFC, I believe, so you can learn how it works. Okay, HTTP overview. We basically have only two things that we care about here, the client and the server. The server, you run a server. It listens for incoming connections, right? Incoming what kind of connections? TCP connections. And you actually know exactly how that packet got all the way from the client to the server. The client opens the TCP connection to the server on the port either given in the URI or the default 80. Then the client sends the request to the server. The server reads that request and sends a response back. Actually, a super easy protocol, right? At a very high level. So we have client running some web client. So the other thing about web client, the kind of HTTP language of this is user agent. So it's like acting on behalf of some user to access a resource. Uh, so you'll see user agent or UA there. Client is also how I think about it because I think it's because I come at it from an angle of looking at server side web code and thinking about code that runs both on the client or the server. So I think of the client server just thinking in that way. So this is kind of how I'll present it, but keep in mind, user agent, that's also a thing. So client makes an HTTP request, the server has to parse that request, and based on that request, we'll try to return an HTTP response. So. Oftentimes, the real web is more complicated. right? So we can think about it in this super abstract model, but as you get more and more closer, when you start wanting to do research on the web or understand the web, you need to understand all these different modifications, and even the early drafts of, eight, of the HTTP 1.0 spec point out some of these things. So there could be a firewall in between the client and the server, and there could be a proxy between the client and the server that is maybe caching the response or doing something like that. And the client itself actually has a cache. So it will not always fetch a page when you think it's fetching a page. It loads it up from its local cache. And so, Actually, your request will go through your, your organization firewall. It'll then go through maybe the server side's proxy. Then maybe it'll hit the server and so on and so forth back. So you actually have this pretty complicated workflow here of multiple parties interacting just to serve this HTTP request. So the request, as we saw, means what? What does the request mean? Headers. Yes, the method. What type of request? Well, yes. the payload. Query parameters. Query parameters. What? Yeah, so we need all that information. What information doesn't it need? Does it need the scheme? Time. Time set. From the URI. The components of the URI. Does it need a scheme? No, you're making an HTTP request. Assuming your HTTP request is valid, that's the evidence that you need that you're making an HTTP request. What about the authority? Why? Yeah, but I'm 
a server. Do I know where I am? No. Why not? Server will be managing multiple hosts. Yes, so that's okay. So hold on to these thoughts. So we have the method, we have the resource basically. So which thing to grab? So basically, everything in the URI after the authority. The protocol version is actually a super important one, right? Even IP level has this the protocol version number in one of the headers, right? Why is this important? Good, I said. Exactly, I need to know what protocol, I need to know how to interpret your request, right? Is it a valid HTTP 1.0, is it a 1.1, is it a 2.0, right? So this allows you to actually increment the version number, and if everything up to the, the protocol number is the same, then you can do cool stuff. Client information, so usually the client will offer up some information in the headers about it itself. Who is making this request? What does the server know always from the request? The return IP address? The IP, exactly, the source IP address and the source port. Right? Because it's receiving a TCP connection, it always has that information. Some body or always said is payload. Cool. So the syntax, we have a start line followed by headers followed by the body. Each line is separated by a CRLF, which is the control characters of carriage return and line feed. This is a super important. I know a lot of you didn't follow this on your servers, and at some point I'm going to update my script to check for this. <laughs> but this year was not that year. So, headers need to be separated from the body by an empty line. So this is how, this is how you get around not knowing how many headers are going to send. So the method, so the method part of the request line is the method that the client wants to be applied to the source. So a get basically says, hey, give me this thing. Post says, hey, I'm actually going to give you some data in the body, usually. Put is actually one that's not as well known, but it's known more of the REST style of application. And actually, REST did a lot for bringing a lot more attention to these other HTTP methods. Um, and head is very cool. It's actually useful for debugging. It says, hey, respond to me as if I had sent a get request, but don't include a body. So this is useful for kind of testing different things. Like if you're maybe trying to see if a resource has changed, you can issue a head request first. If that body is going to be huge, you issue a head request first, which may have headers that tell you if it's changed or not. Okay. There are all kinds of methods, though. I'm going to kind of briefly skim over these. Uh, options, tr delete, trace, connect, all kinds of crazy stuff. And the web server can actually define arbitrary methods. So a web server can extend and support any arbitrary methods that it wants, which is kind of cool. So for example, this would be an HTTP request. So we first have the, the first line, which is the which is the method, exactly, followed by white space, followed by the path, including the query. Yes. And then the protocol version number. And then we have our headers. So headers are usually colon separated fields, of um, like key value fields. So here we have user agent colon, so the user agent is curl. So now we have this host header, which is telling us who we ask for, what the authority is. Accept tells us what kind of things we we can actually accept back, what kind of file formats and file types. The host will talk about it in a second. This is a super simple command line curl request. Modern requests are much more complicated. So they all have the first line the same, I mean, generally. But they'll also say what kind of encoding they accept, so the server can actually, at least offer gzip encoding, can actually gzip the content before sending it over. Um, the user agents are much more complicated and more detailed. 
So a response, yeah. How do you check for authentication? How do you check for authentication if a client will have to access that entity or not? Uh, yeah, think about that. About to get to there. So a response, an HTTP response. When you're responding back, you also respond with the version of the protocol version number and say, hey, here's an HTTP 1.1 response, right? This, again, make sure you don't have these protocol mismatches. A status code which says exactly what this response means, a short reason for that status code, some headers, and then a body. So the syntax, same thing, status line, headers, body. It's almost the same as a request, except for the status line is slightly different. So these status codes are really important. This is where the 404 not found thing comes from. This is the status code in HTTP. So status codes are three digit codes. The first digit defines broadly what category it is. So 100s are all about informational. So this means that like, hey, I got your request and I'm continuing to process it. I've literally almost never seen these. It actually, ooh, that'd be a good hacking challenge or something. I mean, codes and information in these 100s. But I honestly don't know how the browsers would respond to all of these things. 200 is the one you want to see. A 200 was like, yeah, that was awesome. That was successful. I got your request, I understood it, and I accept your request. 300 is the way for the server to say, actually, that thing you were looking for needs to go somewhere else. So broadly, 300 means, hey, like you need to actually do more work in order for me to handle this request, right? For instance, like we talked about, maybe the thing you're looking for moved somewhere else, right? Maybe some other authority is handling that resource. 400 means you screwed up. So the client, your request could not be fulfilled or there's an error in the request, right? So like 404, means like, you messed up, man, I don't know what that resource, I don't know what document you're talking about. Right, four, I think it's, it's 401, know. Authorization, yeah, 401 is the, hey, actually you're not authorized to view this. And so we actually can talk about very quickly a, a very easy form of authentication that they can do. So based on what we saw right now so far, what can be, web server authenticate you on? Your IP address. That's about it. That's all, I mean, so could you authenticate somebody off of their user agent? Could you? You could, but why would you not want to? Yeah, this comes from the user, right? This user agent is set, it comes from the client, and we know from the stuff we did on binaries that user input is, all, is the devil and should never be trusted, right? All of this stuff is untrustworthy. But we know how difficult is it for somebody to spoof their IP address in a TCP connection? Hard. It's pretty hard, right? They have to do the three-way handshake, right? It's not impossible, but it's a lot more difficult. Okay. So 500 means I mess up. The server says, oops, uh, something happened, I screwed up, your request was fine, but I blew up. So a 500 error usually means that there's some error on the server side and it can't handle the request. Anybody see any other kind of status codes or questions? Which depends on how 
a web server to configure. Same with 500 errors. Cool. So some of the status code will be like 200 okay. Like two, there are other types of 200s. Uh, 300s, you have a 301, which means the thing you're looking for can always be found over at this other place. And you can cache that forever. Right? And caches can cache that information. 307 is a temporary redirect that says, hey, this time the thing you're looking for is over there, but maybe not always. Uh, 400, like a 400 means you made a bad request. So if you uh, make some request and you, you have to really mess it up for something to barf on that. But um, if you just type like gibberish, I think, it would probably give you a 400 error, hopefully. 401 is unauthorized, 403 forbidden, 404 not found, 500 means, hey, there's an internal service error, and there's other kinds of 500 errors. So from this example request, so this is using curl to access resource slash, so it's always a slash, right? That's the root. There's nothing else in the path of host www.google.com. And the response you're going to get is going to be something insane like this. But it still follows that exact format. So we still have the protocol that we get sent back. So it's an HTTP 1.1 response. We've got a 200 status code, and we got OK. So everything is all good. Then from there, we have all kinds of crazy things. We have the date. We have an expires, when this thing expires. Uh, all of these are cache controls, so you can see actually how important caching is to the architecture of the web. Of the web. And all of these headers are standardized in the standard about what they mean. So you have all of these. Uh, oh, the other cool thing about here, any header that starts with an X means what? I think it's experimental. It may be extended. I think it's experimental. So this is like a, this is a feature that's not currently a standard, but people want to test it out. And I think you need to X and then a dash, and then whatever comes after that. So this way, old browsers, well, a if they see something they they don't understand, they'll ignore it anyways. So you can start sending headers like Happy Birthday, or I think there was some company that put like job like a link to apply to jobs for that company in their HTTP headers. Um, so your browser, when it sees, if it sees something it doesn't know, it just ignores it, right? There was a hand? No. You need to stretch. So the other critical thing here is that we set the content type header. So there's, like I said, there's another standard called MIME. Anybody know what that stands for? Ooh, wait, was it? Who had it? Multiple, what was the second one? Multipurpose internet mail extension. Multipurpose internet mail extension. Wow, I would not have gotten that ever. <laughs> oh, which makes sense. It comes from email and like attaching files and how to tell somebody what file type you sent. That makes sense. So here we're saying it's, a it's an HTML response that I'm sending back. And even, this is actually a tricky thing, the character set that I used to send this back to you. Is it an ASCII? Is it Unicode? Is it another one? Because there's lots of other ones, right? What type of encoding? Because if you think, right? The important thing is what the browser gets back here is just bytes, right? It's literally just getting a bunch of bytes back. And so it needs to know how to interpret those bytes. So this is the payload here. We know it's an HTML page because it told us that in the content type. Let's see, other things. This doesn't have anything interesting. OK, cool. So let's go back to our previous example. Why do we need to tell it the host? I think you used that right. In case that uh, server is managing multiple hosts. So in HTTP 1.0, there was no he host header that was required by server or by client. So it seems counterintuitive, right? Because like I said, I kind of made fun of, well, I wasn't doing it on purpose. I was doing this because I knew we'd come back here, right? So when you think about it, the authority is already specified in the URI. 
So I know I'm a web server for Google.com. When you come to me, I should know that I'm a web server for Google.com, and therefore, why would you need to tell me what you're telling me for? But if you had this, then you would need a one-to-one -one mapping between every single host name, like every DNS name, and every IP address. Right? Because so you, if you want to run multiple websites, you have to run them on different, that's, yeah, different IP addresses. So that way the server would know based on which IP address, which host did you want. So they said that's actually kind of crazy. You may want the case where you have one server which handles tens or hundreds of hosts. And so that's why each of the clients in HTTP 1.1 send the host field here so that the server getting the request knows which host to use. Yeah. Does, this, does that mean that the uh, authority, you know, if it's changed to the IP address, it goes there. So if the authority is google.com, it's going to the servers that host google.com. And it's this host that actually says that this is the, uh, the server that I want to access? Yes. So the client will click on a link. So the link will have the link. So this would be a link for HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com slash, right? And so that link would generate this request. So if you do a DNS request, it would actually get back a lot of different IPs for google.com. And it will actually depend on where in the earth you are doing this request from, because Google will send you a different uh, DNS list to give you servers that are close to you geographically. So it will give you different IP addresses of servers, then you would pick one of those servers and you would connect to that and then you would send this and say, hey, I'm looking for Google.com. Fun fact about Google, you can talk to any of their servers and change the host name and it will, like their servers are just front ends. So you can change the host name to access any Google service you want, which is super interesting if you're using an internet that only allows you to go to, let's say, google.com, but doesn't allow you to, you to go to mail.google.com or docs.google.com, and so this can allow you to check your email sometimes. Okay, so all this, any other questions on responses? Making good progress, I like it. Okay. HTTP authentication. So, fundamentally what we've seen and all that HTTP is up until now is a request and response mechanism, right? So the server, in order to give this page back, all the server knows is this information. All it knows is the client's IP address, the client's port, and all of this information. So you can think of web servers essentially have amnesia. So every time they get a request, they go, oh, hey, new user, awesome, what are you looking for? Oh, the home page, great, there it is. And then you click the Google search button and hit enter. They go, oh, hey, wow, new user, cool, oh, this is a search, great, I'll pass that to the search thing, here's your search results. Every single time, which would be insane to think about in terms of authentication, right? So how would you actually authenticate anybody or give some of you access to some content some of the time, right? So there is authentication actually built <coughs> into HTTP. So there's this, what's called, it's surprisingly called HTTP authentication. So the idea is there's this really simple challenge response mechanism. The challenge is the server sends a 401 and says, hey, you're not authorized to access this page. And there's a realm that you can specify. And it's super annoying because your browser will then pop up with that browser level box of username, password, and say, hey, you're not authorized to access. Any access, like I think the SharePoint site here do that. If you're using like Safari or Chrome, and it's super annoying, it looks like a, a phishing attack. So the client actually then will need to include an authorization header that includes these credentials. So let's look at this. So basic authentication, the client basically puts in a username and password, 
And then that information is base64 encoded. So what does base64 encoding mean? What is it? What would be base16 encoding? Hex. So what would base64 be? Yeah, use 64 characters to, to encode data. What's the difference between encoding and a hash? Hash is one way. And encodings are? Two way? What does that matter? You can decode a hash. Encoding. So fundamentally, a good hash function, you should never be able to go back. Right? But encoding is just changing, just like percent encoding. Right? If I gave you something and said this is percent encoded, you could decode it, right? It's not a secret. The same thing here. So it's fundamentally your browser is sending your authentication credentials in the clear, base64 encoded. So can you, after all that I just said, could you be able to crack the username and password? Yes. Yes, you just pass this thing to a base64 decoder. It's the simplest thing in the world. And if we're talking about HTTP, what does that mean? How does this header field, this authorization header, how does that go from the client to the server? In plain text, so that every single router along the way knows your username and password now. If you're on an unencrypted Wi-Fi, anybody could see that username and password. And if anybody is on your local network performing any ARP man in the middle attacks, they will also see this password. Do people sort of like servers like take data that the HTTP data routed over the internet and like sort of like listen in on channels like that? How would you do that? I want to. I'm just curious about that. Well, I'm asking everyone. How would you do that? Stay louder. Can you like have like set up an HTTP server where things get routed through you? All HTTP requests sort of like you know. You have to pretend to be people. Yeah. Or like it's not all like ISPs do it. You know. You have to be a switch. So you have to be a switch somewhere in the network. Who does that remind you of? Nobody wants to say it because they're probably listening. I'm looking at the microphone. NSA? Yeah, the NSA, right? So part of the Snowden docs actually revealed that they essentially had this at a far greater level than was originally thought. So I believe it was even Google, they were shocked that there was the ability, I don't think it's ever said how, but there was the ability to monitor their inter uh, data center communications. Where before that, they had assumed every, so they were pretty good about encrypting everything coming in. But then when it was in Google's network, they would assume it's fine not to use encryption on the communications in between. So as soon as those came out, they completely changed their architecture. So now all the internal communication is also encrypted. Now that assumes that people can't access your encryption keys, right? <laughs> we have some good story there too, so. We'll not touch that issue <laughs> very much. But it's interesting to think about technically, right? What would you need to do that? So, basic authentication is purely terrible. Like, on the face of it, it's awful. HTTP uh, 1.1 authentication is a little bit better because it defines cryptographic digests and hashes that can be used. Uh, and the server sends a nonce to the client. The client sends a request of a hash of the username, the password, the nonce, the HTTP method, and the requested URL. The downside here, the big problem is that the web server needs to validate all this information, so it needs to actually have your username and password in the clear, which means if you break into the web server, you now have all these people's usernames and passwords. So this is, if you've ever wondered, God, I can't believe I use so many websites and they all make me log in differently, right? They all have different workflows for logging in. Should this be baked in an HTTP protocol? The answer is yes, it is, but it sucks. So every website has to roll their own. Yeah? So what exactly is a nonce? A nonce is a random one-time value. So the idea is if I was able to, so if I was able to sniff this information without a nonce, then I could say, hey, I want to, I want to uh, log into your website, I just give this blob that I snipped from you, and then I can send that along, and the server will think I'm you. So the nonce basically is a random value. You say, hey, this time, 
prove that you know all this information and include this random value. So I know that each time is different. What if you sniff the random value? Yeah, then all, none of this matters. <laughs> it makes it slightly better. So I can still log in as you, but I can't actually sniff your username and password off the wire. So, HTTP traffic, when we start to analyze it and look at it, because just like uh, debugging and learning GDB to debug binaries, we need to actually look at HTTP traffic to understand what's going on. Uh, HTTP traffic sniffers, so there's, uh, you can use TCP dump to collect traffic. Uh, servers can do a lot of logging. Browsers, so actually now browsers are really awesome. I actually rarely, I mean, depending on what kind of like time testing or web stuff I'm trying to break, usually I'll just use a browser. Like, especially modern browsers with their development tools and JavaScript debugging are actually really good nowadays. Uh, uh, very cool things, so on the client side, so there are client side proxies. I highly recommend Burp Proxy is the best proxy on the market. They have a free version that you can use. Uh, it's a proxy that you specify to intercept all your traffic so you can see and view all the HTTP requests you're making and HTTP responses. And it's super useful just as a proxy when you're pen testing something. Uh, it's even more, it has other cool modules of like repeating attacks and doing all kinds of cool stuff. Burp proxy is the best one. So is Wireshark a proxy? Wireshark is a sniffer. So Wireshark just listens to everything that's going on. By, right? Wireshark is essentially graphical TCP dump. This actually forwards it or something? Or yes, so that you have to modify your browser. So in Burp Proxy, you, uh, yeah, you have to change your browser settings to say, hey, I'm using this proxy, it's running on localhost and port 8080. And so every time your browser goes to connect to a website, instead of connecting to the website first, it connects to the proxy on localhost 8080. And then it says, hey, I'm trying to connect to this place. And so Burt will then go make the request on your behalf. So it's essentially your man in the middle in your own traffic so that you can see everything that happens. This is how people break basically like, um, like iOS or Android apps. So they can see what requests are getting sent from the app back to their servers. And then they can try to pen test those requests to try to manipulate them to do something bad. Which is something that app developers never realize and don't actually think that people can see all these calls. Okay, HTML, so we're getting through the, the trinity today. Awesome. Hypertext markup language. It's actually a fairly, so has anybody on a web page right click and clicked on view source before? Okay, there should be more hands, you're all computer scientists. These are the programs. I mean, you don't have to raise them now. <laughs> I believe you. Just internally, if you haven't done that, don't go bad, just go do it so you can say you've done it. Okay. The idea is it's a very simple markup language so that your documents are portable from one system to the other. So unlike something like PDF, which is a proprietary data format, HTML is specified and open. And so this way, you can write multiple browsers for this uh, hypertext markup language is originally based on HGML, so this is kind of the precursor to HTML. HTML, uh, HTML 2.0 was proposed in 1995, 3.1 in 97, 4.01 in 99. Then they went in this crazy direction. So then after 4.0, they created XML, every turn XML. So I actually thought that XML came before HTML, but it actually is the other way around. So from HTML, because it was so popular and successful, they said, oh, we should extend this to not only capture hypertext markup, we should extend this for arbitrary documents. And so that's where you got XML, that's where you got schemas. Uh, that's actually what part of what I was doing at Microsoft. So I didn't deal with huge, huge schema documents and XML documents. Um, and actually a lot of our training forms are in XSLT too. But anyways, so what they did is they created this XML, and then they're like, oh, this is amazing, it's gonna take over the world. And they looked back at HTML and they said, but HTML actually isn't valid XML. 
because of the way the tags are structured, and because there's a lot of shortcuts that are taken in HTML. So they try to shoehorn HTML back into XML, and they created an XHTML in 2000, and this completely failed. So this was around the ancient time I started web programming, and I honestly never understood the difference between the two. Now, when you view it from like a historical and political perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but XHTML is essentially dead. HTML 5.0 is the new standard. It was proposed as a W3C, uh, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. That's where the C comes in. They're basically a group that's responsible for kind of leading the development of, of the web. What Tim does, I think, pretty sure who pays them now. So the other cool thing is that HTML is now also a living document. So you have this really interesting property of HTML, and that is that once a server starts sending documents with a certain hypertext markup language, right, browsers either have to decide are they going to read that and understand it or not. Right? So if you've ever wondered why there's so many bugs in browsers, it's because a browser today has to not only support HTML5 and 5.1, it has to support all the garbage that has existed up until then. <laughs> yeah, because the thing about it, how many of you use multiple browsers? Yeah, I do. I switch. I use Safari now because it's supposed to be more energy efficient on the MacBooks, which use a lot of power. But I used to use Chrome a lot. Before that, I used Firefox a lot before Chrome came out. Um, and so, if you were using a browser and you went to some web page and it said, oh, sorry, this is an HTML 2.0 page, I can't display it, what are you going to do? Yeah, get rid of it and go to a new browser, right? <laughs> Nobody has time for that nonsense. So this means that browsers need to support this. And it actually leads to something else which I was going to talk about later. Browsers not only have to support all these different standards, they actually need to support the terrible HTML that developers write, <laughs> which are often not to the standard, right? Because it's the same thing. If you went to a website and you're like, ah, so there's an image, but there's no image here. And you saw a little warning message on the console. It's like, actually, an image tag needs to have to use an H6. You'd be like, this, this browser's garbage. The browser's broken. <laughs> I'm going to a different browser. That was the problem. Exactly. And so because of this, you have these things where browsers are incredibly permissive about the HTML that they accept and display, which actually leads to a lot of security bugs. Because it's in these weird corner cases of parsing where browsers treat things differently that weird things happen. So, oh, and fundamentally now we have this weird chicken and the egg problem, right? Where with HTML, let's say you want to create some new HTML feature, how do you do it, right? Do you lobby the browser developers to support it? Well, why are they going to support it? There's 10 things they can do. No website actually supports it yet. So then how do you get website owners to actually use this new feature? Because no browsers support it. Right? So this is why you need these experimental features so people can in, implement things in browsers and be able to test things out both on websites and on browsers. So that's why you need consortiums like uh, the W3C in order to bring all these people together to talk about these things. It's a super interesting problem. Okay, the basic idea is you have raw text that you want to mark up with tags. So which is basically going to add meaning to the raw text. Of course, I'm not talking about meaning and kind of like semantic meaning, not necessarily, but it's going to be more meaning than just raw text. Metadata. Yes, it's essentially metadata, data about the data. So a start tag looks something like this. So essentially a bracket, a start angle bracket, some text, which is the name of the tag, and then a closing right angle bracket. So this would be a tag with the name foo, and this is a start tag. It can be followed by, after that, any kind of text, arbitrary text, whatever. Also other start tags. Finally, it will be closed with an ending tag. So an ending tag is a start angle bracket, a forward slash. Okay, yeah, I never remember the difference. Um, I know backslash is on the statement, but. Uh, okay, so forward slash, and then foo, and then the name of the tag, and 
and then a right angle bracket. That's it. Well, there's, well, and a lot of others. There are also self-closing tags, which are leftovers from XHTML. So you start a tag, you have a slash, that's equivalent to a start tag with no text followed by the end tag. You can have void tags, which are super interesting. So you have, so essentially all start tags must be matched by an end tag. So essentially that tells you which part of the HTML document is this valid, this tag. Uh, you can have some tags that have no end tag, like an image, which kind of makes sense. Like the image doesn't say, like, oh, the image is from here to here in the document. No, the image is here, right? This is where I want the image. And that's defined in the HTML5 spec of which ones are which. Okay, tag, yes. I was gonna say it's basically all containers. Yes, so you can think of it like a tree, which is how we think of the tag structure. So the tags are hierarchical. So you first have HTML. So the HTML tag is the root of the tree in this case. There's nothing outside of it. Next, the first child of the HTML tag is gonna be the head tag. This is part of the HTML document that's like the headers in the HTTP response. It tells you metadata about that page. <coughs> One of the things in there, for instance, could be a title tag. So now, title would be a child of a head, which is a child of HTML. Title as text as its child of uh, example, and it could have other tags. Head has a sibling, so now HTML has two children, head, body, and the order there is important, right? The order that they appear in the document. Body has a child of P, which stands for paragraph, that has text inside of that document. Questions? So you kind of like, if we turned it sideways, right, we'd be able to actually pretty closely draw the tree from this. Um, if you look on your browser, you go to a web page, you right click, and you say, I think, like, inspect element or something, it will actually show you on the developer console the whole dot, like HTML tree up to that point. It's going to be much more complicated than that. Good question? Yeah. I was going to say in Firefox, you have the little uh, uh, add-on. It's like a little bug. And then um, when, you, when you use the add-on, it will make the whole page. You can see every box that every mm -hmm. tag yep. holds. Yeah. Is order actually important there? Yeah, no yes. matter if written a page that says head afterwards, but the answer I believe is yes. It would depend. Again, there's the question of will the, does the standard say it's okay? And does do browsers still parse it correctly? I think this I believe this is a standard uh, maybe it's later. I believe this is a standard HTML5 page. Like this is a semantically valid, like the least number of elements that you need. I think the standard says you need these things in these work, this order. So this would be the, the tree-based view of this. Now, tags themselves are not very expressive, right? All we have is title, head, HTML, P, right? That doesn't actually allow us to specify more metadata about the tags. So attributes are another incredibly important part so every tag can add some attributes. Attributes essentially live inside the tag. So between the name of the tag and the closing right angle bracket, there'll be a series of attributes. Also super confusing, there are four different types of syntax here. This defines an element, a start tag named foo, with the attribute bar. Other questions? No. So foo is the tag name, bar is some attribute. The other way is you can specify values for attribute names. So this would specify a tag name foo with the attribute bar, which has the value baz. You can also put the value in double quotes. Exact same thing. Uh, single quote. Oh, the B made it look like a double quote. Oh. So you can put it in double quotes too. So these are all the different four types of syntax, and there's different escaping mechanisms. Well, in single quotes, you need to do slashes, uh, backslash to escape it with single quotes. With the double quotes, you do the same thing with double quotes. You can put IDs, custom IDs. 
And multiple attributes are separated by spaces. So you can have multiple attributes on a tag. Each of them, can, each attribute can use this different syntax. So you can have something that looks like this. Okay, uh, all right, we'll stop here. We'll come back up.